Okay, hello everyone. Um, today I will be lecturing on molecular genetics. So this is the bio portion of the course. So let's get straight to it. Okay, so first of all, we're going to go over some of the brief contents of what I'm going to go over today. I'll talk a bit about the structure of DNA, and then I will talk about um, transcription and gene expression a little bit more in depth from the first lesson. And then I will go over um, the relationship between outward traits or phenotype to gene expression and genotype. And then finally, I'll go over current genetics. Okay, so let's first talk a bit about DNA because that's the main focus of genetics. DNA is a very, very, very long molecule. Um, it's, a, its shape is a, looks like a double-stranded helix, which is like a ladder twisted into a helix shape. And it's made up of subunits called nucleotides, which are composed of three things. Uh, phosphate, which is one of the functional groups that we learned about in the first lesson. Um, a sugar. In DNA, it is a sugar called deoxyribose. It is a five-carbon sugar. Um, and it's very closely related to a sugar called ribose, which you might know about. And it has one less oxygen than ribose. That's why it's called deoxyribose. And the third component is a base, a uh, nitrogenous base, and it's known as a nitrogenous base because it's a component that contains nitrogen and acts as a base in solution. So this nitrogenous base can usually be one of four um, types, adenine, cytosine, uh, thymine, guanine, and they compose with these nucleotides together, composes a DNA. So the structure of DNA is very special. It's a very special molecule in that it's extremely um, long, even by um, macromolecule standards. Compared to other macromolecules such as proteins and sugars, um, proteins and sugars both may have very long polymers, but they aren't anywhere near the length of DNA. Um, the length of one DNA molecule, like in a chromosome, human chromosome, is like many thousands, millions of times the length of the cell. But the cell still manages to compress this huge length of DNA into a chromosome. So um, DNA structure is very special in that it's extremely regular. It is uh, actually the people who first discovered the structure of DNA, Watson and Crick. Um, originally, um, many scientists in, during Watson and Crick's time believed that DNA couldn't be um, an information storage molecule because it was so regular. But in fact, it was the bases that carry the information. So DNA is made of two strands, um, which are technically each individual molecules. And these strands are held together by a base pairing, which is basically hydrogen bonds between the bases, um, as you can see in the image right below the board. Um, as well, the outside of the um, DNA molecule on either side is what's known as the sugar phosphate backbone. And this is the portion of the nucleotide with the phosphate and sugar. And it's special because regardless of what kind of uh, nucleotides are being used, regardless of what kind of bases, um, the sugar phosphate backbone is still the same. So this is one regular structure. And because phosphates are negatively charged, they also have some unique properties that allow proteins to bind to them. OK, so besides this, DNA is also impressively um, compacted into chromosomes and chromatin in a regular cell. And although it's a bit beyond the scope of this um, lesson, the basic idea is that um, DNA is wound up on uh, protein balls, which are compacted together in a zigzag shape in order to finally compact them into a chromosome. Um, so scientists are still figuring out exactly how DNA is being compacted because it's very complicated, but um, that's the basic idea. Okay, so now that we've taken a look at DNA, let's talk about, about transcription. So transcription at its most basic level is the idea of taking the DNA, uh, the genetic information, and creating a copy of it using a slightly different, but it's a very similar and related uh, nu nucleic acid called RNA, okay? So what happens essentially is that much like DNA replication, which we talked about in the first lesson, DNA is pried apart 
and a complementary strand is synthesized, but it's a complementary strand of RNA. And it marks the beginning of gene expression, which is basically the mechanism by which DNA carries out the action written in its genetic information. Um, because DNA contains all the information needed to create a cell and to have the cell carry out all its duties, but the DNA doesn't contain um, or doesn't actually carry out the actions by itself. It recruits RNA molecules and protein molecules to basically do its job. So gene expression means the mechanism by which um, DNA recruits um, or creates other kinds of molecules to essentially do its job. And um, this can include uh, RNA molecules and proteins mainly. So as you may expect, um, this process is heavily regulated by many mechanisms. Um, for example, transcription factors, which are a special kind of protein, um, bind to the DNA and regulate how fast it's transcribed. And heterochromatin, um, in the previous slide, you can see in the uh, chromosome, I was talking about DNA compaction, right? Heterochromatin is a special kind of DNA compaction where the DNA is compact. Uh, it's so compacted to a degree that the RNA polymerase, which is the uh, protein that creates the RNA trans trans sorry, transcription, is unable to access the DNA. So heterochromatin is another mechanism by which cells use to regulate what is transcribed. And as well, receptors, different kinds of receptors commonly um, check whether or not um, a particular gene is supposed to be described or transcribed or whether or not a gene is supposed to be active. So for one example is um, hormones. So you'll see later in the slides, but hormones commonly bind to transcription factors or receptors on the outside of the cell and ultimately cause a gene to be transcribed. Now, without getting too much into the detail of exactly how transcription happens, um, I want you guys to get a big overview picture because that's the most important thing. But the basic idea is that there is a protein called RNA polymerase, which um, separates the two strands and creates a transcript, RNA transcript of a gene. And there are other proteins involved, and, but that's the basic idea. So you'll see in the picture to the right that a huge amount of proteins seem to be bound to the RNA polymerase. And these proteins are uh, what you can call control elements or transcription factors. They're related to um, the RNA polymerase and they determine how fast or whether or not the RNA polymerase will transcribe the particular gene. Okay, now we've talked a lot about transcription. Let's look a little bit more in depth into gene expression. So I talked about before how gene expression is the mechanism by which DNA carries out its actions. But um, transcription is just one part of this overall picture of gene expression. And it produces either the RNA or the protein product. And it's usually due to a receptor or some sort of signal. So there are several cases in these pictures. Um, one kind of example is when a signaling molecule binds to the outside of the cell through a receptor protein. Ultimately through a pathway called a signal transduction pathway, um, the cell ultimately transcribes RNA, uh, mRNA and causes gene expression into only a particular few uh, genes. As well, um, some hormones, which are uh, lipid soluble, can pass straight through the plasma membrane and they bind directly to a receptor protein inside the cell, which usually acts as a transcription factor. Okay, so you can see in the picture below the bullet points that um, there's a lot of pathways by which DNA, RNA, and protein interact. For example, I talked about in the first lesson how DNA polymerase is replicated, um, replicates DNA, but as well, RNA polymerase um, transcribes DNA into RNA and uh, reverse transcriptase, which is an enzyme found in viruses, can transcribe RNA back into DNA. And RNA is transcribed or trans, sorry, translated into proteins by um, ribosomes, which I talked about in the first lesson. So. There are a lot of different pathways by which genes are expressed, but the general idea, which you have to remember, is that DNA doesn't carry out the actions directly by itself, and instead, um, it's 
very important to realize that DNA is recruiting like proteins or RNA to carry out its um, action. Okay, now I'm going to talk a bit about the relation of phenotype to genotype. So essentially, phenotype, which I went over in the last lesson a little bit, is the outward appearance of a particular uh, organism, or it can also be, you can think of it as the particular trait of an organism. For example, uh, blue eyes is a phenotype. A uh, phenotype can also refer to the entirety of the organism traits. So um, here I'm using it to refer to the entirety of the organism. Genotype is the, you can think of it as, it's not really the opposite, but um, genotype is the entire genetics of, um, the genetics of the organism or the particular gene that an organism may have. So in this case, right, I'm discussing how genotype and phenotype are related. That is, how does the, an organism's genes affect its outward appearance or its traits? So there are several ways. The most obvious is by gene expression, right? By how genes are expressed, how um, uh, DNA carries out actions inside of cells using proteins or RNA. But there's also one important thing to realize, which is that um, an organism's phenotype doesn't just have to do with its DNA or genetics, right? Obviously, for example, if an organism get it, uh, like a human gets its arm cut off. That's not coded for in its DNA, but it's still a part of its phenotype, right? Or if a organism has a particularly different, um, like a, if a person goes to the gym and they get a significantly larger muscle mass than is coded for by their DNA, that's nurture. Um, that's their environment affecting uh, the own phenotype of the organism. However, DNA is still a very big part of an organism's phenotype. For example, um, a person's eyes may be blue, and this isn't something you can ne necessarily change by um, any sort of environment or uh, environmental um, change, right? So um, both of these have impacts on an organism's uh, phenotype. Additionally, uh, Genotype is also multifaceted. It's not just the DNA sequence that's important. It's also important to realize that epigenetics and epigenetic modifications um, are important to how the DNA is expressed. So epigenetics is this concept that um, outside the DNA, there may be different kinds of effects that can change the way the DNA is expressed and change the organism's genotype or phenotype without um, changing the actual sequence of the DNA. So not the nucleotide sequence. Rather, things on the outside or around the DNA may be changed. Or, uh, for example, there may be particular kinds of molecules which are long-lasting because epigenetics can be passed down from organism to organism, but they don't involve the direct effect to the DNA. Okay, so another important thing to realize is that uh, an organism's penetrance and expressivity of a particular trait is very complicated. It doesn't solely depend on um, the DNA. So one good example is the uh, issue of polydactyly. So polydactyly is a trait um, or a word meaning having extra fingers. So normal humans have five fingers, but some people have extra fingers. And this is due to a dominant um, mutation. But however, some people with the dominant mutation don't actually have any extra fingers. And it's not that this is uh, the organism doesn't have the dominant trait or the trait isn't really dominant. It's that this allele is not fully penetrant. And that means that it's not always going to be expressed, even if it is a dominant trait. So as a result, the organism's genetics are very complicated and it's not just dependent on a single gene relating to their phenotype, right? There's also an issue of expressivity. So what this means is that depending on the organism's genes, um, it's important to realize that different people, if they have a particular disorder, may have different levels of the disorder, uh, which is also dependent on their genes, their environment, and whatnot. For example, um, sorry, excuse me. For example, um, going back to the polydactyly example, some people only have one extra finger 
or others have many extra fingers. And this is a difference in the expressivity or the level of expression of a particular trait. Okay, so why is this important and why are we talking about it? Well, one thing you might've heard in the news a lot recently is something called CRISPR. It's a um, genetic uh, engineering tool which was recently discovered and is very useful to scientists for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's um, very useful in order to help genetic engineer certain kinds of organisms because you can give it a guide RNA and sort of knock out or replace certain genes. And that's very useful. So as a result, um, genetic engineering is um, improving day by day. And scientists are continually making new and new uh, discoveries regarding genetic engineering and genetic engineering is growing as a field significantly. Additionally, um, different kinds of molecular mechanisms and um, molecular genetics as a whole is a relatively recent field. It's only been established maybe in the last hundred years or so um, compared to other sciences such as like physics, which has been around for thousands of years. So as a result, there's so many discoveries still waiting to be made, right? And new discoveries are being made every day, most of which are very significant to biology as a whole or the way that we view a person's genetic makeup or how we view an organism. One example of this is a technology known as next generation sequencing. So um, in the historically, uh, sequencing DNA has always been very difficult because uh, first of all, DNA is very long. There's a lot of data to um, carry and organize. And additionally, there are a lot of repeated sequence in the DNA. So it's hard to sequence the DNA very accurately, uh, especially with chemical methods since DNA is ultimately a molecule. So therefore, um, a lot of sequencing mechanisms have been developed. One important one is called uh, it's called uh, Sanger sequencing or Didioxy sequencing. And it's a very old mechanism of sequencing, which uh, slowly uses uh, nucleotides with different kinds of sugars called Didioxy sugars. And as a result, the scientist is able to figure out the sequence of the particular DNA. However, this is um, a very slow and expensive sequencing method. It was a mechanism used to sequence the first human's um, genome, but it's extremely expensive and not very fast. So many next generation sequencing mechanisms have been developed in order to sequence DNA faster. For example, there's like electroporation mechanisms where, um, or electrophore mechanisms where DNA is fed through a single um, like electronic hole, or there are other mechanisms that exist out there which allow to sequence uh, vastly greater amounts of nucleotides per second for a lot less cost. Uh, the result of all these new sequencing techniques is that um, it's becoming more and more easy for the average person to get their own genome sequenced. And as a result, personalized medicine is increasingly important. So basically personalized medicine is this idea that um, traditional medicine where we create one sort of pill that should fit every single person is not effective because um, different people have different genomes. And ultimately that means that different effects will happen based on the medicines. But in the future, as next generation sequencing improves, um, people will be able to sequence their genomes. And as we understand more and more about what th that means, how their genomes are sequenced and what this particularly means, it, it means that in the future, different kinds of therapies will be given for different groups of people. And this is the field of personalized medicine. And it's highly, highly reliant on genetics and personalized um, genome sequencing. So this is why molecular genetics is so relevant currently. And it's probably why you've seen so many of these topics come up in the news. Okay, as a quick conclusion, uh, genetics is a very major field in a large amount of fields of biology and molecular genetics is a very fast growing field. Now we're going to play a quick Kahoot. Um, tomorrow we'll be going over uh, some, lastly, some uh, ideas regarding evolution, but this pretty much concludes the genetics lessons for now. If you have any questions, 
message me, but I'm going to send a Kahoot in the chat and then we're going to play it. So, yes. Has everyone joined that wants to join? If you haven't, please message me. Uh, we'll do a review quiz tomorrow. Yes. Uh, I mentioned this during the lesson, but a nucleotide contains a five carbon sugar, or a DNA one contains a five carbon sugar known as deoxyribose. The other kind is uh, RNA. RNA nucleotides contain ribose, which is also a five carbon sugar.
Okay, so this is a special one since uh, so many of you got it wrong. I'll talk about it. Um, adenine forms bonds with duracell in mRNA or RNA only. Okay, so I'll talk about the history of this one for a little bit um, because most of you guys got it wrong. But Watson and Crick um, were the ones who elucidated the structure of DNA, but um, they were doing it using um, Rosalind Franklin's X-ray crystallography picture. And Morris Wilkins was a related colleague, but he didn't perform the X-ray crystallography.
Oh, one thing I will say about that last question, it's not totally correct. A deletion doesn't always give or cause a frame shift mutation. So the answer to that one wasn't completely correct. But uh, if it's not a multiple of three, the deletion, it will cause a frame shift. Oh, this is assuming double-stranded DNA, by the way. Um, okay, I will explain this because um, I don't think you guys understand the question. So in a sample of DNA, assuming that it's double-stranded DNA, right? If 15% is guanine, that means that also 15% is cytosine, right? Because um, cytosine binds guanine, assuming there's no strange mutations or anything, cytosine binds guanine. So 15% is guanine, 15% is cytosine. As an extension to that rule, if there, there's 100%, right? Uh, you can think of there's like 100 nucleotides, uh, 30 of them will be guanine and cytosine. That means the remaining seven must be adenine and thymine, right? In equal parts. So the answer is 35%. Does that make sense? Uh, I hope you guys understand.
before you guys answer this one, I will describe how to use the codon chart. Um, you start in the inner wheel and then go outwards to find the amino acid. Okay, congratulations on, on winning for our um, For this particular uh, Kahoot, a lot of the stuff wasn't necessarily in the slides I talked about, but there are things that you need to know. Um, I didn't feel like if I glossed over some of the things because they were not conceptually too important, um, but I believe that like for the sake of these slides, um, if you understand the concept, you guys will be fine. That's pretty much it for today. Thank you guys for listening. Um, there are like 15 minutes before your next class if you want to go. Um, but thank you all. And um, yeah, that's it for today.